next on Sisterhood of the Second Act. Women received the right to vote in Virginia in 1920. You may have heard of the women's suffrage movement. Women in each state had to fight for their rights, and that includes the women of Virginia. Marianne Julian from the Library of Virginia co-authored the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia with Brent Tarter and Barbara Batson. She joins us today to talk about the amazing women who fought for your right to vote. Dr. Bonnie Hennig-Tressman came to Roanoke to help Carillion set up the Carillion Clinic Huntington's Disease Program. It offers help to people with HD and their families. We'll meet these women on this edition of Sisterhood of the Second Act, right after this. Sisterhood of the Second Act is brought to you by Looking for your first home or retirement home? Realtor Monica Nicely can help you find it. Whether you're moving in or out of the Roanoke region, call Monica 540-449-2019, 540-449-2019. Alcova Mortgage Loan Officer Jonathan Sweat helps you seal the deal with the loan to suit your needs with great rates and terms. Call Jonathan 540-314-8843, 540-314-8843. Alcova Mortgage, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS ID number 40508, MLSConsumerAccess.org. Terms and conditions apply. All loans subject to credit approval. I'm going to be an oak tree. I think I'll be a dogwood tree. My kids said they'd be looking for a thorny tree for me. With Evergreen, you can be a tree. Our biodegradable urn combines your ashes, natural soil additives, and a native tree of your choice. Be a tree and grow for tomorrow. I want to be a tree. Learn more at evergreenmemorialtrust.com. Cabby fashions take you from the boardroom to the beach. Dress for a garden party or a night on the town. Independent cabbie stylist Darlene Marshall will make sure you look your best no matter what the occasion. She'll bring the store to your home for you and your friends or schedule a private consultation. Call Darlene, 540-330-6819, 540-330-6819. Or find her on Instagram at Dapper Darling, on Facebook at Darlene Marshall Independent Cabby Stylist. Pat Lucas is committed to providing independent financial advice to individuals, families, and small businesses. Contact Pat at 540-798-8104. 540-798-8104. Securities and investment advisory services are offered solely through Equity Services Incorporated, member FENRA SIPC, 4401 Starkey Road, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018, 540-989-4600. Now from the Fox Radio Roanoke studio, here's Kathy Heberly. Welcome to Sisterhood of the Second Act. I'm Kathy Heberly. Women, both black and white, joined forces in the Virginia Women Campaign for the vote. Mary Julian is an editor at the Library of Virginia and is working on several projects. She co-authored a book, The Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia, with Brent Tarter and Barbara Batson. And that's the subject she joins us to talk about today. So thank you for being here. Thank you for asking me. It's been a pleasure to, to learn a little bit about you and to understand a little of what you're doing. So I would like our audience to get in on our conversation we just started. It's wonderful. People have probably heard of the women's suffrage movement. What they might not realize is that it was a 50-year fight for women to get the right to vote. Did women in all the states gain the right to vote at the same time? Um, actually, no. They, oh. Women um, in Western states uh, had, in certain Western states, had the right to vote in the 19th century. Um, and in the years after the Civil War, the suffrage movement um, started, there was some some disagreement over whether the fight should focus on women getting the right to vote or African-American men getting the right to vote after the Civil War and after the 14th Amendment. Um, the 13th and 14th Amendments gave them citizenship and then the 15th Amendment gave African-American men the right to vote in 1870. But the suffragists, um, they started campaigning state by state okay. because states governments controlled elections, you know, and who could vote. So um, 
Western states, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, I think, I can't remember the years, um, but you know, by the 1890s, a number of Western states had the right to vote. And so they kept up this state-by-state -state campaign and women in different states, mostly west of Mississippi, they could vote not always in every election. Some states, women could vote only for president. In some states, women could only vote in like local municipal elections. It was not the same everywhere. So and if, no consistency. There was no consistency. Okay. A woman could, and if she moved from one state to another that didn't have the right to vote, she lost her right to vote. Oh my goodness. So, so this, but this was how the the suffrage campaign was um, was working. And in Virginia, in the 1870s and the 1890s, there were a couple of short-lived suffrage organizations, but they didn't really catch on and didn't last very long. So in 1909, there was a group of um, some socially prominent white Richmond women, most of whom were involved in uh, progressive era reform efforts, you know, trying to improve public education, public health labor laws, temperance movement, things like that. And, you know, these women you know, wanted legislation to, you know, improve public schools. Well, it was hard to do that if you couldn't actually vote for the right. people, the legislators who were, you know, passing the laws. So they created the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia in 1909 and, you know, started trying to build support for voting rights for women and for the state legislature to amend the state constitution in Virginia to um, to authorize women's suffrage. And why did it take so long? <laughs> well, <laughs> suffrage support was, it took a long time to build support for women's suffrage, you know, throughout the whole country. Uh, and especially even in Virginia, women, you know, since colonial times, right. women have been a dependent class and their fathers were responsible for them, their husbands, you know, once they got married were responsible for them. Women in Virginia until 1877, once they married, they did not control their own property. Their husbands controlled it, you know. So this was, you know, women were not seen as independent, you know, people. So, um, you know, and then uh, people also would, you know, say things like, you know, politics is a dirty business. Women are above all that. You know, they don't need to be getting involved in politics and voting. Um, you know, voting women would be a menace to, you know, the sanctity of the family and the home. And, you know, they would threaten, you know, they would threaten society by, by stepping outside the boundaries of what their behavior was supposed to be. Incredible. <laughs> How did the women's suffrage campaign in Virginia differ from that in other states? And were there different challenges here? Um, in Virginia, well, like other Southern states, um, it was difficult in Virginia because racial discrimination plays such a big role. Um, you know, the Equal Suffrage League was for white women and men could also join. You know, they, they did not expressly prohibit African American women from joining, but it was understood that, you know, Black right. Virginia women would not participate. And even when um, the more militant group, the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, um, these were the suffragists who, uh, in a little later, 1914, 15 and on, they were fighting for an amendment to the U.S. Constitution because, you know, they started right. to see that if we go, if we can get a, an amendment to the United States Constitution, all women everywhere will have the right to vote. It will be consistent. You know, you won't have these yes. different laws from state to state. So, um, but the Virginia branch of the Congressional Union, which later becomes the National Women's Party, you know, they also didn't expressly prohibit black women from joining, but in Virginia, they, they didn't, um, or they couldn't. But that doesn't mean that black women were not, you know, also fighting no, for involved. their right to vote Correct. because they, you know, Maggie Walker, who's the civil rights activist in Richmond, and she um, was the first African-American woman to be president of a bank. She also published a, um, 
a newspaper for the fraternal order that her bank was a part of, you know, in editorials and articles in the newspaper would reference women's suffrage. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, so people, they would be reading about it. Um, there were, you know, black women had uh, clubs, you know, the same way that white women yes. did, you know, the women's club movement, working for reforms, um, you know, and the women in those clubs would be talking about suffrage. They, these groups would, were part of the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And yes, they had, you know, many of those women right. would, you know, they would spend their time, sure. you know, Do, yes. working for talking, discussing, you know. We are talking with Mary Julian from the Library of Virginia. And who were these women and were, who were the major players in the Old Dominion? Um, there's a lot, a fair number, um, most of whom have never been in history books before. The president of the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia, the only president from 1909 until um, you know, 1920 after the that, amendment right. was ratified, was Lila Mead Valentine. <laughs> um, she was from Richmond. She was you know, a member of a very socially prominent family in Richmond, and she had long been active in public education reform. Sure. Um, one of the vice presidents who was very instrumental during the later years was Elizabeth Langer Lewis. She was um, from Lynchburg and she had organized the local Lynchburg Equal Suffrage League and she was a vice president. Um, Lila Me Valentine, you know, would sometimes right. suffer poor health. And so Elizabeth Lewis would step Oops. in and, and take very over. But yeah, and then there were a number of women around Roanoke. Roanoke was kind of the center of suffrage activity in Western Virginia. That's good to know. Yes. And uh, the 100th anniversary, I want to get to this, of Virginia women mm -hmm. gaining the right to vote was in 2020. Yes. So tell us about the library's exhibit. I know it's closed now, but how can people learn more about these women? Um, we do. The exhibition was open 2020, and we had extended it into 2021 with the pandemic. We have a traveling version that is going to different libraries and museums around the state. Um, I'm not sure where it is now, okay. but there is a you schedule. You can probably look it up. There yes. is a schedule on yes. the library's website. Um, we did put a number of our resources online um, at the library's uh, website. You know, we have a timeline. We have links to biographies that we wrote about suffrage activists, sure. um, you know, a map of all the local suffrage leagues. The Equal Suffrage League had more than 140 chapters with 20,000 members, you know, all the way from Big Stone Gap to the Eastern Shore. So they were all over the state. My goodness. So that communication would be really important back then, I would think. Yes. They wrote a lot of letters. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> they wrote a lot of letters. So we are talking with Mary Julian from the Library of Virginia, and uh, we only have a little short time left, but could you tell us about the Library of Virginia? What types of collections are housed there? And can anyone research there? Anybody can come research at the library. Um, we are the state's library and archives. We keep um, records for state, from state government throughout okay. history. We also have, um, we house some records from localities, you know, different okay. localities can, you know, keep their records at the Library of Virginia. And we also collect personal papers from individuals. We collect organization records, which, you know, we yes. have the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia records at the library, um, which was very helpful in helping yes. us document this whole story. Right. Well, as we mentioned earlier, you co-authored the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia. And where can people get this book? Uh, well, you can get it at the library shop um, through the Library of Virginia. It's also, it was published by the History Press. So it's okay. available through the History Press website and you can, it's also available on Amazon. So for anybody that wants to learn a little bit more mm -hmm. about the history. Um, yes. We can, we can do that. So I so appreciate it. I have so many more questions. I wish I had more time. <laughs> but thank you for being with us today. Sure. Thank you. It's my pleasure. We'll have a link to the Library of Virginia at our show notes at sisterhoodofthesecondact.com. And there's more Sisterhood of the Second Act ahead. Huntington's disease is a rare inherited disease 
when we return help for families impacted by this disease. Pat Lucas is committed to providing independent financial advice to help women build wealth and security. Call Pat at 540-798-8104, 540-798-8104. Securities and investment advisory services are offered solely through Equity Services Incorporated, member FENRA SIPC, 4401 Starkey Road, Roanoke, Virginia, 24018, 540-989-4600. Looking for your first home or retirement home? Realtor Monica Nicely can help you find it. Whether you're moving in or out of the Roanoke region, call Monica 540-449-2019, 540-449-2019. Alcova Mortgage Loan Officer Jonathan Sweat helps you seal the deal with the loan to suit your needs with great rates and terms. Call Jonathan 540-314-8843, 540-314-8843. Alcova Mortgage, Equal Housing Lender, NMLS ID number 40508, MLSConsumerAccess.org. Terms and conditions apply. All loans subject to credit approval. Once again, from the Fox Radio Roanoke studio, here's Kathy Heberly. Welcome back to Sisterhood of the Second Act. I'm Kathy Heberly. Huntington's disease, or HD, is a rare inherited disease that causes the progressive breakdown of nerve cells in the brain. Symptoms of HD often first appear when people are in their 30s or 40s. There is help in the Roanoke region for families impacted by HD. Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman is the director of the Carilion Clinic Huntington's Disease Program and an assistant professor at the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, Department of Basic Science Education. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Hennig Tressman. Thank you for having me. What is Huntington's disease? Yeah, well, you, you did a really nice job in terms of the introduction. Thank you. That it is a um, genetic progressive neurodegenerative disease, which does mean that it is passed down from family member to family member, that it is it moves, it, it changes over time. Okay. It is a brain disease, and it gets worse over time. So it is a brain disease that gets worse and uh, is passed down from one generation to the next. There are three types of symptoms, three groups of symptoms that people who have Huntington's disease can have. And I say can because people assume that it starts with one, you move on to the next, and then you move on to the next. You can have one, two, or all three of these symptoms. Okay. And I try to tell people to remember the symptoms with the letter M. Oh. So the first one being mood. There's sometimes mood changes. People can have anxiety, they can have depression, they can have irritability, they can be impulsive, they can have these changes. Okay. Sometimes the other one is memory, that they yes. can have executive function, what we call executive function losses or cognitive deficits, where they're having difficulty organizing and planning and remembering things. And then, as you said, something about the movements, that right. people can have these movements called chorea or even dystonia that will um, be these involuntary movements that people can have. Okay, so there, it could manifest in different... It can, yeah, even within the same family, even with okay. you know, siblings, Oh, right? And there are, um, right now, there is no cure for Huntington's right. disease. So I do want to let people know. We can treat the symptoms, though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's important to know, as well as really trying to walk with people on their journey. Um, it is, however, fatal. Yes, it's something that, yes. So what services does Carilion Clinic Huntington's Disease Program offer? Really everything when it comes okay. to that. What I say is that people who have the gene are affected by it, but you have this whole group of people around who are impacted by Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. That's children, that's coworkers, that's family, that's everybody. So you don't have to have this gene or be at risk, but there are a lot of people who are impacted by this. And, and we try to treat everybody Everybody. This is a family disease. Yes. So it's from sometimes before people are deciding if they want to be tested for this gene all the way to end of life care. It sounds very supportive too in yes. many ways. I think that's so important. Yes. And because Huntington's is a genetic disease, if a parent has it, how likely is it that a child will develop it? That's a great question. Huntington's disease, or HD, as you said, is what we call autosomal dominant, meaning it's not linked to the sex chromosome. It can be uh, passed down to a male or female, a boy or a girl, and also that only one parent needs to have this gene in order to pass this down. So when you do all the math and you do biology 101, it is 50% at risk for every single person. 
So sometimes I have people say to me, well, I've got four kids. Two will get it and two won't. Right. No, because chance has no memory. That's right. So each child has, has a 50% chance, chance of getting That's this gene. That's my understanding. Yes. So then you're saying it's not more dominant in men than women no, or anything not. like that. No. Okay. That's... Um, I think I was unaware of that. Yeah, a lot I, of people, one time I thought it was more common in females, and I don't know why, maybe because that was my experience. Yes, but a lot of times um, it is. We are talking with Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman, and she's the director of the Carillion Clinic Huntington's Disease Program. Now, you mentioned assisting with the decision to test for HD for yes. people who are at risk. What types of issues do you have to work through with your clients? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And really only about 20% of people who are at risk, meaning that they have a parent with Huntington's disease, get tested. Because they would really, a lot of people would rather live at 50% at risk than 100% knowing. Remember, there's no cure for this disease. Right. And people are still, there's still a stigma about this and they're still afraid of this. They don't know if this is going to impact their future in terms of their employment, what they do, having children. So we really start way back in terms of why people want to get tested. And it's very individual for each person. I see. Um, so for some people, they wanted to know, you know, for their family. For some people, they want to make decisions about their lives. For some people, they just know every single day they're thinking about this and they want to get tested right or or maybe some do have in mind as for children I'm, I'm sure that can can come into play since we know for sure it is genetically correct. linked That's correct right. so I think another thing is if somebody has the gene will they develop HG yeah. HD so of course HD does not mean that you don't get other diseases like correct. cancers it doesn't prevent you from having trauma or an illness or anything like that. So if a person has inherited this gene and they live long enough, they will come down with symptoms of Huntington's disease, yes. Okay, well, that's, I think that's something that they need to, you know, everybody needs to be prepared for, yes. I th yeah. like anything. What are the pros and cons of testing? Yeah, for HD. It, really, it really is individualized for people. For some, like I said, they, they feel like they just want to know so that they can plan their lives. For some people, they're saying, I don't want to know. I don't want to know how um, my, you know, I don't want to know what the future holds and I'm going to wait. So it really, it, pros and cons are very individualized. And we talk to people about what would it mean if you knew you were negative? What would it mean if you knew you were positive? Mm -hmm. and, and going through that with each individual who wants to get tested. And in terms of the disease, whether you choose to, to know or not once symptoms start do, do because it's progressive does that still mean it's individualized to the person where some people just progress more rapidly That's than others? That's a really good question, yes. Does so it? there are okay. something called genetic modifiers. So besides the gene that causes this, yes. the protein that, that uh, kills off these brain cells, there are other genes that affect um, how fast the, the, the uh, disease will progress. Also just you know nature versus nurture that when people are in high stress situations or don't necessarily take care of their body well right. or use drugs or alcohol, that can impact the progression of the disease as well. So we talk to people about all uh, of those all things. Of it. Well, I like that and I like you, uh, that you have a family component to dealing with it. And so how does the Carillion's uh, HD program help families? Yeah. Sometimes we can't change the person's behavior who has Huntington's disease, okay. but we can change a family's reaction to their behavior. So it's cognitive behavioral therapy or even just behavioral therapy that we can provide support. We can talk to kids about, uh, right. uh, about Huntington's disease. We can talk to families about talking to their children about Huntington's disease so it's not so scary. And we can provide that whole framework in terms of support so that people can pick up the phone and say, I'm having difficulty, how do I deal with this? Excellent. That, that is so important. We're talking with Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman. She is the director of the Krillin Clinic Huntington's Disease Program. And you are also a researcher. So we don't have a lot of time, but tell me, what types of research do you do? I'm very interested. Yes. So I have done multi-center drug trials. Actually, at Carillion, I am mentoring a medical student, Abigail Ruffle, and we are working on what we call an observational trial. So we're looking at factors that impact quality of life for people who are at risk people with Huntington's disease, as well as caregivers. And that's just going to be something easy in terms of uh, being able to answer questionnaires on the computer. Okay. So we'll be you know, giving out some more information. Is that information going to be an ongoing uh, program? Uh, it, it'll, or it'll, be, 
that research is going to be over like about a year or a so, year. Okay. but we'll get information out to people so that people who know somebody with Huntington's disease or if a family themselves is watching, that they can contact us and get some information about this. I think that's really a, yeah. a really good idea. This, right? I really, yeah. I think research is so important. I think you feel like you're making, you're, you're doing your best to make a difference. Yes. And um, one of your other roles is the special programs director at HD Reach. Yes. What is HD Reach? HD Reach is an organization, HD advocacy organization organization that started in Raleigh, North Carolina okay. by a family, a psychiatrist and her sister who um, are from a family with HD and they knew that they needed to get uh, uh, special programs in North Carolina. Now that I came down, I took over some of those roles and we actually provide genetic testing to uh, people in three different states. Uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. Okay. And we are able to offer genetic testing for people at risk without having them go to a, a medical uh, facility. And sometimes that makes people feel a little bit better that it's anonymous. I like that. So yeah. we have to wrap it up. But if somebody has HD yes. or has a family member with HD, yes. what would you urge them to do? Absolutely. Please call me. Just, I'm happy to talk to anybody. You can even just Google Carilion Clinic Huntington's Disease Program. We have a whole web page. We'll give you the contact information. Just pick up the phone, even if it's hard to get the person with Huntington's disease or who's at risk to, to the So office, a family member could call? Family member can call me. I will walk them through all of this. If people want to call and they don't want me to know their, their name, that's fine as well. Just so give call me a anonymously call. If, call. You, if you need to. Just make the call yeah. and you will get them in touch and get them started because Absolutely. I'm sure they... Uh, once they get this, um, I s suppose you have to be officially diagnosed, correct? To be, say you have Huntington's d disease. So remember, having the gene doesn't mean you have right. the, 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 but the if, disease. But if you so, are showing symptoms, you said you do have the disease. So yes. is that when you know, okay, things have started? Yeah, that would okay. be one thing, but people can call, call us whether they're at risk. Whether, okay, yes. very good, yes. just for family members. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for coming in today so much, Dr. Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. We will have Dr. Henning Tressman's contact information in today's show notes on our website, sisterhoodofthesecondact.com. And we will be back to wrap up the show after this. Kathy's Wardrobe provided by Cabby stylist Darlene Marshall. See the styles in our show notes at sisterhoodofthesecondact.com. I'm going to be an oak tree. I think I'll be a dogwood tree. My kids said they'd be looking for a thorny tree for me. With Evergreen, you can be a tree. Our biodegradable urn combines your ashes, natural soil additives, and a native tree of your choice. Be a tree and grow for tomorrow. I want to be a tree. Learn more at evergreenmemorialtrust.com. See where a grateful nation remembers its heroes and where Thomas Jefferson came to relax. Where small town charm is just down the road from big outdoor adventures. Find peace and quiet, as well as the sounds of family fun. Destination Bedford is located where the Piedmont Plateau meets the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Where ordinary ends, Bedford begins. I want to thank Mary Julian and Dr. Bonnie Hennig Tressman for being with us today. Mary reminded us of our history as women and how hard the fight was to give women the right to vote and how important it is for us to use this right. Bonnie taught us about Huntington's disease, its symptoms, and its genetic components, something to be aware of. I'm Kathy Heberly. Join us next week for another edition of Sisterhood of the Second Act.